Hello everyone. Good evening and a very, very warm welcome to this fireside chat on a pertinent topic, designing a tailor fit approach to economic, to employee experience. I'm Pooja Bhotra, Senior Content Lead, ETHR World, and your host for this session. Much has been spoken about how artificial intelligence, machine learning, and big data can help transform the customer experience. But what about the employee experience? These tools unleashed by the fourth industrial revolution can also help ensure employee health and well-being overcome a one-size-fit-all approach and equip employers to invest in a proactive instead of a reactive avenues of care. What are the breakthrough innovations in this space helping organizations achieve mass customization of employee experience strategy leading to emotionally invested and motivated employees? Dear viewers, in this session, we have leaders from industry who've joined us to share their first-hand knowledge on enabling and empowering the workforce with customized and hyper-personalized employee benefit strategy. We will be taking your questions throughout this session, so do not wait till the last to share your questions. You can see a Q&A chat tab on your screen. Please use that tab to share your questions. We, will make, we want to make this session very, very interactive for you. So we will take a lot of your questions. Also feel free to leave comments for the speakers. So without much ado, I would like to now introduce the speakers of this session. Please join me in welcoming Saurav Dvedi, partner Deloitte India. Pramath Nath, CHRO Air Pacific and India, Steam Power at GE Power. Priyank Saxena, Senior VP, Health Echo. Welcome speakers. So good to have all of you here. Um, when we talk about personalizing employee experience, it all boils down to the fact that organizations today need to have a very people-centric culture. Talent has surely emerged at the center stage for all organizations who are in the path to transform themselves. Sort of uh, some thoughts from you that today, why is it so important for organizations to drive a people-centric culture and how are they doing it? Thank you, Pooja. Thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you, ETH Award, for this opportunity. I think you've, you've you know, as to kickstart, I think so this is a very pertinent question, right? Uh, because a lot of our clients that I'm talking to, you know, ask us the question or you know, give us the objective that, you know, why don't you come in and help us create a people-centric organization? And especially in the times of, of digitalization and uh, transformation engagements that organizations are going through, right? A lot of uh, organizations are talking about keeping employees at the center, right? And rather than using the term employees, let me use the term workforce because, uh, you know, uh, more and more organizations are now exploring alternate workforce as well. So, you know, what are, what are the top four uh, elements that I think uh, are, are required uh, in order to create a people-centric, uh, you know, organization culture? First, um, I'll start with the leadership perspective, right? Say what you mean and mean what you say. You know, a cliched, uh, cliched quote, but as long as the leadership a team, you know, stays true to their uh, to their objectives, uh, drive initiatives towards those objectives, and are able to achieve that. I think you will be able to get that commitment, get that engagement from your workforce. Right? You you have to walk the talk, uh, you know, in order to create a people centric organization culture. That's one. Second is bottom up is the key, right? Gone are the days where, you know, you could take decisions in the boardroom and then, you know, start imposing those, those elements within the organization. The mantra right now and, and the buzzword in, in this aspect is on co-creation, right? And when, when you're thinking about co-creation, again, 
you have to widen your definition of, of the workforce. You have to think about your regular employees, you have to think about people who are on your payroll, you have to think about your gig workers, you have to think about your people, you know, who are working with you, um, you know, on contract, you have to think about your external vendors, uh, you know, and partners that you that you work with, right? And then using a combination of expectations from all of these is, you know, when you can think about, uh, you know, uh, the defining the, the, the elements of the culture. The third key element, um, I would say, is, is looking at employees' preference or workforce preference, right? Earlier, again, as I said, you know, going back to point number, point number two, uh, you know, we used to think, you know, what, what my employees want or, or, or you know, uh, assess what my employees want. But gone are those days, right? You need to really get down to, uh, you know, their employees. Uh, their requirements, and then you know, start thinking about what are the things that that need to be created within the organization. And the last element I would say is is around hyper personalization or n is equal to one now, which is a look at tailor made people solutions and tailor made not from an organizational perspective. Give the freedom to to your workforce to choose what they need, right? So design design your programs in a way that I, as, as, as an employee, as a gig worker, as a contractor, can, can customize the, the elements or, or policies or processes as per my needs um, and, and my preferences and, and the life stages that I'm at. I think if, if organizations are able to blend some of these elements within the organization, you know, they, 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 would, they would have started the journey towards a people-centric organization culture. Oh, very interesting points there, Saurabh, and I totally agree. You know, leaders have to talk the or walk the talk, and also uh, now it's not about top down, but it's more about bottom up. Uh, that really brings about the change. Uh, when we talk about um, people centric culture, it all goes down to improving well being in the organization. So. Um, Priyank, I'd like to get you now, and I want to ask you, you know, based on your relationship with other organizations that you very closely work with, um, how are companies approaching well-being from, the, from a very holistic angle? Um, also, uh, to what extent is technology helping organizations personalize well-being and employee benefits? I think Pooja, uh, once again, thank you for this session and uh, you know making us meet so many gentlemen over here. Uh, to answer you, know, I think from where you said when you were giving the introduction to the topic that a one size fit all approach has been a conventional way to look into this entire gamut of things, whether it is employee benefit and all. Which, as it is mentioned by Saurabh, also it's it's it has to be now brought down to a point wherein. Uh, the the requirement of each individual's needs to be analyzed and understood, and then accordingly plans need to be committed, right? And um, somewhere I would say that coming from insurance, and specifically if I talk of the employee benefit scheme, the health insurance part of it, uh, these discussions have taken uh, definitely, uh, uh, you know, I think they have become very important part of the entire boardroom discussions, especially post the pandemic. Uh, you know, a lot of emphasis are now coming on employee safety and well-being, and uh, in some way, insurance is is uh, you know has taken a center stage on this aspect, whereby they are aiding the relevant HR stakeholders in terms of designing a lot of benefits program. Now, look into a traditional insurance outlook. You know, the way they it used to be, you know, with some very specific defined coverages, which was again a one-size-fits-all approach. Now, these are changing significantly with more focus moving into, I would say, addressing a multi-generational needs through flexible benefits. Uh, when I say multi-generational needs, let me clearly specify. So what does would this would mean? Let's say with an organization with an age band of, uh, you know, of 25, 26 years to ranging to 40 years to 50 years, the needs and requirement of each of these individuals would be different whether it is in terms of the insurance coverage or the health and well-being requirements for, for these people. So hence addressing multi-generational requirements by designing some flexible benefits or flexible wallets is what is the need that we have been frequently encountered with. Um, certain new age covers, you know, covers related to mental health, 
covers related to the LGBTQ, uh, you know, coverages, gender reaffirmation surgeries, modern treatments, Ayush uh, category of treatments. All these are treat are coverages that are very very frequently now asked, and it somewhere indicates that the uh, relevant stakeholders in the HR fraternity are not thinking very positively about it. You know, there are discussions on alternate healthcare delivery models. You know, like telemedicines. Uh, uh, integrating with some pharmacies, diagnostics, etc., all to be you know well woven within the insurance ecosystem. Uh, in fact, you know we've we've seen we've seen a lot of uh, proposals reaching us wherein people do come back and say that okay, can can we customize and can we customize the flexible wallet of my employee? And in the insurance of the employee, can I also add a pet insurance? Can I also add a, add a bite size cyber insurance for these people? So, you know, all these, these discussions are these days very, very common. And uh, somewhere I would say, uh, you know, this is ch changing a complete, uh, you know, complete change in the overview of how insurance coverages used to look five years down, you know, from now, or yeah, I think even, even three years from now. So somewhere definitely pandemic has also given a lot of change in the thought process of the uh, uh, on, the, on the benefit side, but it's only increasing from here. That's what I've been saying. Uh, very interesting, Priyank. And it's really good to know the kind of flexibility organizations have at their disposal today to select so many different kinds of insurance plans. And so much has really gone into designing, taking you know, uh, note of different requirements of different uh, groups of people. Uh, so continuing on the same topic of employee benefits, Pramat, uh, I would like you to share insurance is one aspect of employee benefits. And, you know, Priyanka has very eloquently told us that how, you know, different um, ways of looking at it is uh, very pervasive in organizations today. But what other factors do go into designing employee benefits today for an organization? So employee benefit is absolutely contextual, Puja. It has evolved that way over the last so many years. And look at how employee benefits have evolved. When the need was for roti, kapla, and makan, the employee benefits were at a minimum. Now today, when the focus is not really of employees on roti, kapla, makan, there is more aspiration post-pandemic particularly after 2020, when there is more self-realization about a wider purpose, a larger family, about people in their late 20s, early 30s, not only focusing on themselves, but also focusing on two other generations, their parents and their kids. So when you have to balance three generations and take responsibility and accountability for a wider well-being, the employees also make similar demands subtly within the organization. And, and the organizations are not reacting to this. In fact, they are anticipating the tide, the flow, and tweaking policies slowly. So I have not seen overnight drastic change in policies. There are some policies which have changed overnight, like caregiver leaves during COVID, where an employee is not suffering from, from the pandemic, but the family members are, and the family members cannot be shifted to a hospital. So the employee needs time to focus on the well being. Organizations have come up with such immediate responses, and hence I will not say reactive. These are more timely responses to a particular situation, and hence contextual. But otherwise, benefits have been evolving. Let's take the case of BPOs and BPOs in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000 till about 2010 were large creators of jobs for educated unemployed people in India. When they came in, they started working on transaction processing, very low end associate level work. But slowly when they needed to scale up and become global and add value, they realize that they don't have either the experience, exposure, or qualification of a management degree. Now, what happened? The attrition at that level, zero to three years of tenure employees, shot up. And the hiring and recruitment cost compelled employers to do a root cause analysis. 
And the analysis said that your employee is thinking big. He or she is thinking about the future relevance of his or her career. Why don't you put in interventions like executive MBA program, part-time, weekend, collaborating with management institutes and sponsor it for a wider group of people so that you make them both role ready for future roles internally, give them a longer career path and retain them. And that is only one basic example because I've seen many organizations trying to retain or successfully being able to retain a sizable chunk of employees by such progressive interventions. Similarly, I heard Priyank talk about pet insurance policy. Now, three, four years ago, we would have laughed at it. But today, it's such a reality, particularly during pandemic, when people have found solace in the company, nuclear families, solace in the company of pets, that the emotional bond has taken it to a different level. And organizations, insurance companies are responding to that space. More so when insurance companies are hard pressed, because if you see claim to premium ratios, it has shot up for all organizations. And it has almost become untenable and unsustainable for both organizations to extend policies beyond the employees, let's say parental cover. And therefore now, and, and again, I'm referring to your point, Soro, where you spoke about co-creation. So organizations are working with employees to co-create and maybe an embed a 10%, 20% feature of co-pay, where the employee partly bears the cost, but still the wider family parents are taken care of. So I think as we are changing uh, the, the landscape or seeing the landscape change, we are also dynamic and agile across these organizations in India to tweak the employee benefits to suit the context today, to be empathetic to employees and also relate to a wider audience outside because your competition is no more internal. There is technology. All of us are knowing what's happening in the outside world. Now look at, look at it when, when a Bollywood celebrity actress talks about her depression. You see a whole set of people talking about mental wellness. And I can tell you, I can vouch my credibility. 10, 15 years ago, employees were subjected after the awful stage to a pre-employment health checkup. And if mental illness would have surfaced there, trust me, no employer worth his or her salt in India would have touched an employee suffering from mental wellness issues. Look at the paradigm shift and how the outside in approach has changed benefits, has changed outlook. We have become progressive for the good. So that's to cut a long story short. That's how I think organizations today, Pooja, are thinking about it. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Pramath. So, uh, Saurabh wants to make a point. Yes, uh, just, just yes. wanted to add, thanks, thanks, Pooja. Just wanted to add to what Pramath just mentioned. I think so pertinent points. And, and organizations are also realizing, Pramath, I think in a way the demographic uh, you know, shift in, in the employee base, right? The, as you uh, alluded to, nuclear families, you know, people moving away from their native places, you know, joining joining organizations, um, you know, both the husband and wife working with maybe small kids at home, you know, and all of that. And, and uh, you know, based on that, the, the gamut of, or bouquet of <clears throat> benefits that are provided to employees now with at cost or without cost, right? Um, you know, that's an organizational preference is, is also increasing. For example, you know, post COVID suddenly a lot of organizations, you know, some big organizations announced uh, work, work from home allowance, right? And then suddenly, you know, there, there were many organizations giving you 15,000, 30,000, 40,000 bucks to set up an office at home, right? Then came, you know, uh, three years, four years ago, many organizations, uh, you know, started giving you a crash at work facility, right? And then, you know, remote working, they said, okay, now what do we do? And, and still mothers and fathers were, were facing difficulties. So they said, okay, we'll, we'll reimburse for a nanny, right? So why don't you go, go ahead and employ a nanny, right? And then so on and so forth, electricity at home, you know, furniture at home and, and you know, things like that. So again, it's, it's about, uh, you know, I, I would go back to my previous point. It's about personalization. For organizations, I think it's becoming more and more important 
to give options to give book a, a menu card as such to to your employees right uh, the, you know gone are the days of again you know uh, cut the cut the foot to fit the shoe benefits right uh, you know you'll get only a 3 lakh coverage uh, for insurance right uh, you will get you have these 100 options right some free some at cost some copay whatever it is and then you can opt for whatever works for you right and and employees are are taking advantage and benefits of these right uh, benefits uh, that that are being provided so i definitely see um especially and and uh, you know indian organizations uh, going up maturity curve in terms of of providing you know some of these options to to their workforce yeah very interesting sort of you know when it comes to employee benefits somehow organizations in india also have a tendency of following what the west is doing so you know there is so much you and cry about google offices and facebook offices and the kind of benefits they have been giving their employees like you know when i speak to these young people they only harbor one dream that is to work in uh, facebook or google because they get free food they have uh, these vending machines wherein they get parts of uh, you know digital gadgets of your mobile phones iphones and these kind of things so uh, but um, i guess there is still some time when we can start seeing these kind of things in india priyank you want to make a point yeah i mean uh, it's somewhat related to what sora went up and just mentioned about co creation of the benefits and taking ownership in terms of you know uh, both employee and the employer taking participation in the in the benefit program i think and this it's also come back to where i was coming you know uh, saying previously yes there are multi generational needs and we all have seen it and you know pramod uh, uh, sora also eco a similar sort of a feeling uh, is is i think it's time for our one size fit all movement to choose your plan movement you know that's what saurabh was just saying i was just hearing it they were just saying that you know why don't you give them a bouquet of services or a products offering or you know coverages which let them choose what they want i mean they can be a basic coverage but then over and above that they can be 20 things which you may want uh, and it's available at your cost at your disposal but you know and and you can choose and build your own plan so how do we do it i think and i think puja this is from where you were just asking me few minutes back that how can technology help in uh, you know arriving at such situations wherein employee well being and all can be assisted so i take i think i think at this this is a place where i would definitely believe that uh, digit, uh, digital levers or maybe technology driven levers in reaching out to the end task force asking them for their choices making them customize their plan uh, you know out of different uh, options available is is the way ahead and you know and we have been personally experiencing lot of our customers working in this way i think at echo we have given solutions to certain clients you know in which an employee chooses whether they want to cover parents or parents in law or whether they don't want to cover anyone right whether they want to buy maternity and if they want to buy maternity what is the limit that they want to buy you know whether they want to have some emi protection built into the plan in case of a uh, leave because of some you know long hospitalization etc you know of all these 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 benefits you know there's a wallet that you can take for take for yourself choose your cover build your plan and you know probably go ahead and, and and design your coverages as per what you need so you know in one of our customer that we are managing you know some 5000 odd employees and 3000 different policy constructs so that is the diversity that we have seen you know 3000 different policy constructs means you know different variations in terms of coverages that were created and you know if that's where i i am i'm i'm saying that i think this is where technology can come in and probably try and sum up some all these coverages in some in some in some fashion and you know give you the coverages as so one in terms of choosing your plan second in terms of delivering exactly what you have been asking for you know these are not possible without our tech intervention that's it. thanks priyank um, i'll just take uh, one of the audience questions now there's a question from charan preet and he's asking how can an organization make the employees realize the difference between experience to benefits versus the higher cash in hand employees still continue to lean towards higher pay that's a reality um sort of I think, yeah i can i can yes. attempt to answer that question but i also know it for a fact you know me going through that cycle for many number of years now and i'm looking at my team members you know going through that cycle and and my clients 
one will never be happy with whatever compensation they get in hand. You know, whatever is the amount that gets credited into their account at the end of the month will always be less. And, and you know, it has to be more. But I, I think um, I'll share, uh, you know, my experience in, in terms of what has worked, right? Um, it, it's more about communicating the total rewards philosophy, talking about, uh, you know, not only cash in hand, but also talking about the benefits, talking about advantages that are available to employees as, as their, um, you know, as the organization uh, provides, right? It's also, I think uh, there has been an increased uh, uh, level of awareness and maturity from an employee point of view, especially after pandemic when they've realized that the kind of helplines that are provided, the kind of uh, benefits that are provided from an organization actually will come, uh, you know, are useful in times of need, right? Pre-pandemic, uh, you know, many organizations had had launched the the helpline, a, a mental wellness helpline, a spiritual wellness helpline, you know, a physical wellness helpline. But you know, I, I don't know the statistics, but I'm pretty sure the number of calls made during that time and post-pandemic there would be a huge change, right? And and those are, I think, uh, you know, if you ask me what is the mantra or or, or how do you make employees realize? Uh, you know uh, the the value of these benefits is is just communication and and and, and making sure that they they realize uh, you know the, the the actual benefits or the value uh, you know all of these benefits provide them. But communication, I think uh, you know Deloitte does it beautifully. Uh, you know there's a huge communication program that runs throughout the year, um, and and uh, we've seen a lot of awareness uh, you know because of that. Uh, interesting, Sora Pramat. So Saurav has given such a fantastic reply, particularly around the total rewards philosophy. I wanted to add something on a lighter note and allow me, Pooja, to do that. I remember two months ago, the president of India also lamented the impact of income tax deduction on his salary. And it came out in a big way in the press. So I think we, and that the messaging was that we need to realize that there is a, IT is a necessary evil. It will be deducted for the wider good of the country, but today most of the progressive organizations have a basket of choices in terms of allowances where one can play and ensure that the net take home to the extent possible goes up. But Soro again made a great point, particularly citing the pandemic and how the pandemic was a savior in many uh, instances. So I think it's also about organizations responsibility to convey to the employees that saving is equally important. For many of us, there is no state sponsored pension available, right? And these savings eventually will come handy during not only our post retirement days, but also during rainy days, which can come anytime and the pandemic has taught us that. So I think organization's responsibility coupled with individual's responsibility to understand this. Interesting. Um, money saved is money earned. So, you know, savings always go a long way. Um, and uh, Saurabh also mentioned communication and we've got some more audience questions, you know, where there are aspiring uh, HR leaders who are talking about tips and techniques. So communication is very important for employee experience, employee well-being uh, benefit. Uh, moving on, um, Priyank also mentioned about how digitalization is helping to streamline multiple insurance policies, give the flexibility, also empower people to select. But digitalization and technology also has a flip side, you know, it makes you lose the human touch. So when you talk about employee well-being strategy, how do you balance between high touch and high tech? Um, you know, to what extent are you using digitalization to empower employees for employee experience? Or is it, uh, you know, too much technology also becomes a problem? Um, sort of? Let me, yeah, I sure, said, Priyan, go ahead. Go on. Yeah, Priyan. because, you know, uh, I agree, Amit Puja. It, it's it's a so while it's a digital first with everything sort of a word, uh, you know, uh, each user, each consumer is seeking some efficiency, uh, which 
I think today it means that you know while we may sometimes prefer an online connection, but it's always in addition to us wanting to speak with someone directly. So even if I today use my mobile application for some banking purpose and you know uh, I do some some transactions, you know I'm always inquisitive till the time that is reflecting on the app. I'm always inquisitive to speak to someone that hey uh, did you receive you know uh, any details on the transactions and all. So I think that is probably uh, that's how we all are built in and that's how how we are, I think even our first things about. So uh, while technology is important, I think putting some human touch to the technology levers is equally important. Okay, so I definitely we agree that. So you know what we try and do and how we are trying to strike some balance uh, in this aspect is like so. So while entire health insurance customer base that we today do. is serviced on technology enabled mobile application right which gives them convenience to retrieve e cards on the go check out cashless do some claim filing etc on the app itself people is uh, you know add on benefits like teleconsult pharmacy etc everything given over there but in addition to this we have not gone away with the conventional way and we still say that on the app itself or from the app itself or maybe through some you know through some dedicated mobile numbers or customer center there's always a person sitting in my call center who is able to assist the end user whenever they feel that you know uh, it, they, they they want a human touch or they want some immediate uh, resolution or they want something that someone should hand hold and just speak to them so there's always that human touch that is available so i think we would somewhere be needing that balance to be to be drawn in this entire uh, you know presentation of proposal that we give and i think we have been we have been to trying to do that Uh, whether it is through health care, health call centers, or maybe dedicated teams servicing certain customers and all, so that balance is uh, is being you know maintained in the in the entire proposal that we have. Yeah, ma'am, ma'am, ma can I add, Pooja, to this? Yes, please. Um, I think uh, a, a short answer to your question is you need a technology. Digital is has to be there. You know, it it will give you the ability to reach the last mile, right? um but the choice of human touch or no human touch has to be again left to the employee themselves because here when you're talking about health and wellness right uh, many times the employees would want to keep it you know the reason why you have third parties you have confidential helplines is because you know the employees do not want to share that kind of information maybe with with the employer right now how much of that information comes back to the organization and how do you use it you know is has to be left uh, you know with the employee themselves to say that okay this is where maybe i need to have a chat with my manager this is where i need to have a chat with the hr and and you know you know how much of that sharing actually needs to happen again you know, the, the the choice the preference has to be left uh, with the with the workforce segment rather than uh, you know pre deciding how much how much i High, high tech, low, low touch. The process has to be, but technology is a given. You won't be able to provide the bouquet of services, benefits, and administer them effectively if you don't have the right digital interventions. Um, thanks, Saurabh. I'll just take one audience question here. Uh, so Sangeeta is asking, uh, wanted to know a list of new edge benefits that are a buzz in the industry today. some new age benefit examples for the workforce i think we discussed some of them you know in, in you know while answering the previous question it's it's again uh, you know the the work from home allowance the the electricity allowance the nanny allowance you know the you know all those allowances uh, or benefits that are being given uh, you know uh, certain legacy organizations have, have also gone ahead and and included uh, you know same sex partners in in life policy life insurance policies maternity paternity caregiver leaves right uh, these are some some uh, you know uh, latest things that have uh, cropped up i think so post pandemic but uh, you know i would um, i would look to pramath also to you know see if if he has um, some new buzzwords with him yes okay. and to that also pramod it will be great if you add uh, you know even though organizations especially mncs come up with so many different kinds of employee benefit yet the attrition rate you know continues to rise so there is also somebody from the audience who would like to know that 
you know, how do these not translate into attrition rate going down? So I wish we, you all had a magic wand, but, uh, you know, some tips and techniques would be useful. So on the first part, the unique new age policies, I wouldn't want to add anything beyond what Saurav ended with, because those are practically what is mostly seen. There may be some peculiar or fancy ones, but I think we need to restrict ourselves with whatever is useful for the wider set of population. As far as the question on attrition is concerned, it is a quintessential problem and it is going to be so. And I think we have to also take it in a positive stride because attrition, why is attrition there? Is it only push or there is ample pull? So if the economy is growing, if there are opportunities, and if the economy is a political economy, means there are opportunities available, there is a dynamic of supply and demand, there are talent which are niche and, and not easily available, or there is young talent which can then grow as far as compensation is concerned. I think this is, this is not at all a bad thing. For, and this is a different perspective. For some organizations, some attrition is always good because then that gives you the leeway to change the demography, the composition and reduce cost. Because typically you strategize that if a person is leaving, I'll replace him or her with a person who is slightly junior in tenure at a slightly lesser cost so that I can give that person also a career path. Right? So that is one perspective. The second perspective is we need to do root cause analysis as far as attrition is concerned because there can't be one solution. A good set of benefit can never be huge differentiator. Right? There are multiple levers. Career is one lever. Coping with the role is another lever. Compensation is another lever. The community I work with is another lever. How is my immediate manager? Huge thing. How, how am I feeling as far as my role is concerned? And how much of pressure do I have, right? And on top of it, if you look at the multi-generational workforce, and if you do a slice of organization, uh, of attrition in the organization, the 40 plus population is the one where the, the attrition is, is least. Why? Because they are tending towards their self-actualization phase. Why is it? highest between zero to three or zero to five years of, of tenure. But that's where the action is. People are slightly more abrasive in taking impulsive decision and joining at a five, 10, 15, 20% hike. There is peer pressure, there is aspiration and multiple reasons. So I think we cannot brush it completely with one pain. It has to, there has to be a root cause analysis. Every organization needs to see how much of attrition is good attrition and then how to attack it where it is in different pockets and then solve it. Thanks, Pramath. Um, you know, a lot changed after the pandemic. And now that we are, you know, in the third wave, and once again, you know, the medical infrastructure uh, is facing the pressure and lots and lots of employees require medical health, uh, medical intervention. Uh, Priyank, I would like to ask you in the post-COVID era, physical and mental medical needs have multiplied drastically for all. What measures have you seen the HRs of your clients, partner organizations take to extend support to the workforce with the ever increasing demands for themselves and their families? Puja, see, physical well-being has always been into existence since the beginning of this you know, era. And it has re scored reasonably well between the HR fraternity. I think that's something that uh, people are quite happy with the way it was there. Now with this hybrid work model, uh, definitely there is a focus on more of uh, digital assistance, tracking, rewarding employees, asking uh, or trying to integrate, you know, wherein we can strike a balance between mental well-being and a physical well-being uh, in the overall insurance constructs that we do. Uh, you know, even if you see parallelly, see, see, you know, modules on, uh, uh, I would say, a lot of fitness-related videos, HRAs, et cetera, uh, they have been also, as part of the discussions into the insurance uh, domain, 
and I think they have helped keep in a check into the employees' health. Uh, and we've seen that, you know, with fitness enthusiasts have, have never given it a miss despite the pandemic restrictions and the lockdowns also. Now, uh, on, the, on the medical side, I would say, so insurance covers have become much more robust today uh, with respect to a wider coverages. And I, as you know, I was speaking earlier, uh, coverages that are going beyond, let's say, modern age related treatment, LGBTQ covers, gender reaffirmation. So these are these are add-ons things that have been asked. But I think more than that, there are there are discussions around mental well-being as a very important part. So you know, while we see coverages seek on the mental well-being side on both IPD and OPD basis, there are some only, only on IPD or on a standalone OPD basis. Teleconsultation, I would say, here has played a very very important role because this gives the employee a personal private window. To consult with a with a with a counselor, uh, you know, on a one on one basis, where there is no mass discussion that's you know that's happening on on a, on a wider level. So these are these are few of the things that we have been actually seeing. Uh, there's a, there's a, that which are, which are coming back to us in terms of the requirements. I mean, I would still say that undoubtedly mental well being has been discussed comprehensively over last one maybe little over one year, I would say. And we have witnessed that people are now coming out and actually talking about this. However, I mean, there is still a lot of road that need to be needs to be covered in this aspect. You know, we're still evolving as humans, as individuals, also on this. But uh, I think with this, there was definitely an additional responsibility of creating an equal ecosystem for the employees, for their loved ones, you know, so that they can feel comfortable in using these assistance or using these servicing services that have been offered. So um, I think having insurance benefits about around mental well-being, like therapies, behavioral counseling, psychologists, consultations, I mean, these are helpful. Uh, and these have been, been, been very much in demand. Uh, we've also seen some discussions around, let's say, EAP, so, uh, you know, which are, uh, so there are, there are uh, vendors trying to do a personalized EAP solution for you. And Again, insurance is one one distributor model that they have been trying to use in such uh, you know uh, to reach out to a lot lot number of corporates and customers and employees for that matter. I think this supported by a robust communication will definitely be essential for the overall corporate health and the individual employees' health in times to come. So I think these are few of the lead asks that we are getting from leading organizations, and we're trying to support our clients in best ways, uh, you know, in all these aspects. Um, very interesting, uh, Priyank. Um, you know, I just hope that, you know, the stigma that is attached to mental ill health, you know, in our country, it's high time we learn how to overlook that uh, because still people hesitate to seek help. Uh, sometimes people also do not know how to give help. Uh, so, you know, there is a really a lot of awareness that still um, is pending in this matter, manner. Uh, yeah, that, you, uh, yeah. So, uh, of all the teleconsultations usage that we have analyzed of all mm -hmm. large customer base, you would be surprised that majority of them actually are belonging to this category, to the mental counseling. I mean, yeah. we do get statistics around these counseling that you know what, how much counsel, how much consultations are being done uh, by a corporate, by an employee. Though we don't share the uh, individual employees' details, but. We definitely give a dashboard or a statistics to our corporate that, okay, look, this is where you are. Uh, we're we seeing a lot of traction by your employees. Employees are looking forward to ask on these things. But then two topics. One, definitely, I think that the mental well-being is the one that is that is most commonly being asked, and followed by a lot of queries that we could, that we saw on COVID-related assistance programs. So these are, these are two essential features that at least last one year we have seen. Yeah, and then, yes. uh, sorry, Pooja, but... Hmm. Uh, I won't be surprised if the statistic Priyank is is valid more so, uh, you know, post pandemic uh, statistic because what we are also seeing and observing and having conversations on is the psychological effect that uh, this pandemic has had on on the workforce as a whole. Right? I think first year went in all in the in the. Uh, you know, hurrah of work from home and we're free and, you know, we don't have to travel. I can be back at my native place. But I think as this is, you know, continuing to, to grow and, you know, come back in phases and all that, especially with the euphoria, you know, that many people faced a month back saying that, okay, return to office, 
people, you know, offices and, and corporates are going to open up and, and you can come to office. And then again, you know, lockdown uh, type situation has, up, uh, has, has come up. I think there are increased number of cases, at least in our team that we're seeing, right? In, in, in our profession that we're seeing where this has had a long-term psychological effect on people. And, and therefore, you know, more and more people requiring, uh, you know, assistance on, on mental wellness issues. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, these um, water cooler conversations that have been taken out from our lives, it's actually left a dent. And most people now, you know, um, with this uh, digital relationship, you know, you don't have real relationships and you have nobody to talk to and listen to. So this is really going to increase. And I'm very happy to know that Priyank, that, you know, ACO has these kind of uh, uh, tools also available in these uh, apps that you have. Uh, uh, Pramat, I'd like to uh, ask you a very, very important question since we have got a lot of, you know, mid-level HR leaders in uh, this session, you know, who've logged in to watch this uh, session and hear you would like to know that what is, uh, the best strategy to optimize your HR investments, you know, when it comes to uh, providing tailor-made employee experience, well-being, benefit, you know, what is a strategy you use to optimize HR investments? It's a great question. In fact, never heard about it, never thought about it. So absolutely a great question. So I think Again, and I'll respond based on the situation that we are all operating in because we never anticipated this, but the world has been, and particularly the HR profession globally has been extremely agile in its response to me. And that's how I operate. And that's how I encourage my organization to operate is to intertwine the workforce strategy with the workplace strategy, because today, we spend a lot of money in beautifying our offices, investing in the offices. There are CapEx expenditures, which we have put in. There are then operational expenditures. There are overheads. And if you actually look at it, these are huge expenses because every employee, and Pooja, you mentioned a comment where you said every uh, aspirant of a job wants to be in Google. And why? Because of the workplace that Google offers, because of the the policies, the flexibility in policies they offer, but we don't realize that Google is a monopoly. There is no Microsoft, there is no Yahoo. They were all left behind by Google 10 years ago, right? So there is no competition. They decide everything. Whereas 99.9% .9 of organizations which run based on fair competition and in which people like you and all of us here are employed, the competition reduces the margin. And, and eventually it becomes a cost revenue game. So as HR professionals, it's also important that we do not talk only about cost pressures and, and then have policies which are fancy, but not affordable in the long term. So therefore affordability comes from cost optimization around the workplace strategy. So today when Sora was talking about uh, offices being rationalized, office space being optimize. That's how I'll recommend that you save cost there and divert it for the benefit of your employees. Now, whether you do it in the form of one time home office setup expense or recurring broadband and internet reimbursement expense or enhancing the employee benefits around MediClaim or cash at hand is solely your call. But then HR needs to strategize one aspect towards benefit. The second aspect has to be channelized towards ensuring a wider career architecture to the employees. Because for each one of us, what is important is not merely what we are doing today, but also how do we evolve over a period of time? How do we enrich ourselves, our roles, and outgrow the job that we are doing today and be role ready for something bigger tomorrow within the organization? That is the second aspect of HR. And then how can HR do that today in a hybrid environment is by leveraging technology. So whether you had initially gamification to start, let's say onboarding or training programs today, because you are remotely functioning, you can't do gamification. So you focus on AR, augmented reality. 
and then you make sure that you have simulations which keep the employees also interested in the work that they do and which brings a real life situation to the employee because then they learn they bring themselves up to speed and they also work beyond their silos in a more collaborative environment so that's how i will optimize the cost that is given to me to to run my budget in fact and i'll stay put here because it will entail a, a, a lot of discussion thereafter but technology as a platform from onboarding to performance management to learning intervention can be a solution in today's time while yet focusing on cost and optimizing it pooja thank you pramod these are very valid points very insightful i'm sure the audience is making note of it i'll just take one more audience question this is from ayushri and she is asking now the organizations are also putting a lot of effort on de and i how can we create an inclusive workforce and an impactful effort to kind of make them feel inclusive as well how unconscious bias and micro aggression affect the same let me take that and maybe sort of priyanka i'll request you to add uh, again few years ago these were new concepts and let me tell you india is following west in terms of this because we have bigger problems we have bigger hygiene problems to face there were social stigmas around it but it's not that i'm a fan of movies and hence i'm saying but but look at how things are pictureized in in lot of movies let's take the case of a recent hindi movie chandigarh kare asiki in that movie look at how the hero has been transformed and converted to an advocate right that is only a personification of this wider problem now let's take it back to the organizations and let's see how we are trying to sort it in many of the organization including ours i think you have to do it in a piecemeal uh, basis awareness is key first awareness around the wider philosophy because not everyone each one of us have not been educated at home these are still taboos and stigma to talk uh, on on dinner tables in the families there is no school education or college education which prepares us so eventually it's an adult education that we go through during our our stint with progressive organizations so awareness is key awareness around these these topics and i'll tell you a startling number uh, in one of the organizations that i worked for a, a very premier consulting firm there we did a survey and came to know 8% of our employee base had lgbtq tendencies and it was hidden and none of the policies really catered to that huge group now you are talking about close to 10% and no policy so then we started with awareness then focused on e which is equity more equity driven policies to suit and cater to this group of people and then we started inviting panelists from outside and sharing experience with naysayers with people who did not understand the concept and then the challenges that they faced then we realized that we were so cut off from the realities and vagaries of the world that at times it it made you feel guilty so i think you need to do a whole lot of thing from panel discussions to open discussions to policies to empathy show to sessions on unconscious bias and then do it over a period of at least 1 to 3 4 years time frame to be able to be role ready and to talk it with pride to participate in events such as pride marches with pride and then to side with with people so once you start doing it openly once you start hiring people with these preferences and then giving them a spot in the sun on various platforms in the organization and that's where you have a mindset change i see saurav's hand raised so let me pass yeah. it on yeah no thanks pramod i think i think really really interesting facts but you know the reality also is that in india right i think pramod you you you're talking about dei from uh, you know a broader perspective but most of the indian organizations right now when they talk about they don't talk about dei they talk about dni right and when they talk about dni mostly what they're trying to achieve right now is gender diversity right 
but in india as 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 large as we are right and as diverse as we are we are not we not many organizations definitely are talking about lgbtqs not many organizations are talking about diversity from from the point of view of pwds we are not talking about uh, you know uh, the the religious caste creed all that kind of diversity although that exists in organizations in india right you go to an organization in south of india you would find the leadership team being from south of india you go to an organization based out of west of india you would find the leadership team being from west of india right these are all unconscious biases that 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 are there in the organization nobody is is aware of it nobody wants to talk about it right and north of india the same thing right you would find a lot of people from so i think first of all uh, as 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 an organization think about what dei means for you right and as as pramath said take it incrementally you know don't boil the ocean don't try and you know become uh, you know the the apple of the world or the facebook of the world where you know dei is ingrained and you know they 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 have taken steps through multiple number of years right to to promote dei so define what dei is for you define your priorities right now look at how will you actually increase your maturity when it comes to dei uh, scale and then you know take concrete steps right and and it will take a lot of effort not only for hr folks of the organization but the business leaders right this dei has to be top driven right it has to be an excess of communication across the organization and then you know making sure that when you start hiring people with diverse backgrounds in the truest sense of diversity and inclusion is you know when you'll start seeing your dei dei maturity going up within the organization right i've seen um, personally i've i've been part of a lot of engagements in the last two years where uh, you know we are looking at the dei maturity of organizations sad to say india is is i think we're starting on 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 that journey right we are we are nowhere you know as, as compared to west so so there is there is there are a lot of things that that indian organizations mncs in india as well as indian organizations need to do uh, from a dei perspective yes pramath you want to make a point yes so i'll just add i think for organizations which are beginning on this journey the easiest thing to do is to focus more on inclusion first and and how can they do that all of us can do it there are junior folks both by tenure and experience in the organization who are given no time to talk on calls or in meetings so as senior leaders as hr professionals on this call first step is to ensure that you hear even junior most employees and allow them the opportunity to talk in meetings like make the workplace more inclusive first like that is one simple step with which we can start and which is also easy to do totally agree uh, priyank you mentioned you know that you have insurance policies that also act as a leveler and it is more inclusive in nature uh, to what extent is insurance benefit a uh, leveler for de and i in workplaces any thoughts oh. yeah i think uh, puja the only uh, feature that you know comes to up as under this component is you know asking for an lgbtq cover that's it that's the most common cover that you know we have been asked of lately that you know employers are asking and i would say if you if i look into the size of the employers i think as low as a as a 50 60 employee company to as high as a 5000 employee company there have been asks on these parameters you know from uh, virtually every employer nowadays so in a way there is a inclusion policy or a philosophy but is it translating into actual inclusion or is it translating into actual usage you know as 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 kamath mentioned that are we actually practicing it is a question mark that we i mean really need to ascertain it is it just a check in the box that okay i also have a uh, policy which covers same gender partners Or is it actually being implemented, and you know there's some quota reserved for these people? Is a question mark that probably you know that organisation cannot be answered. But yes, we are seeing those covers being asked. Coming to the gender reaffirmation surgeries and all, I think these are covers that are very very selective even till now, uh, because of the cost associated and to some extent because of the stigma associated. People even if they want, they don't come out for these things. I mean, no, I mean, shorts can actually 
give the entire cost benefit of such procedures to an individual because those are highly expensive. So from that aspect, these are you know those those I feel are more a check in the box unless and until they are practiced on the ground. True. Um, so we you know we have made a start, but there is a huge leap that is required in this field. And you know till now our workplaces there are you know various groups uh, which are underrepresented. Uh, you know various economic backgrounds, tier three, tier four cities. And like Pramath uh, said, inclusivity is the key. The more we make our workplaces inclusive, the more we make our well being and uh, employee benefit initiatives broad based and holistic to appeal to more people, more of your whole workforce, rather than a small sector of your workforce, the more inclusive our workplaces will be. I'm conscious of time. So we've come to the end of this session. I thank all of you to taking out for taking our time and joining us for the session. And I'll just conclude by saying, in business, there is no one size fits all when it comes to employee benefit initiatives and programs. Every organization and individual's needs are different. By tailoring programs to engage employee interests and increasing awareness to drive program usage, organizations realize improved outcome and increased business performance. Thank you from entire ETHR World's team for joining us today. Thank you.